Uh, welcome, everybody, to episode seven of Transcendent Naturalism, which is part of the Cognitive Science Show. Uh, I'm here, of course, with my continual partner in all of the Cognitive Science Shows, Greg Enriquez. And we have uh, Brendan Graham Dempsey here with us today. And what we're going to do is the following. Greg is going to give us sort of a, a, a quick synopsis and mm -hmm. synoptic integration of where we're at uh, in terms of the previous six episodes. And then he'll uh, turn things over to Brendan. Uh, Brendan will lay out his uh, framework and then we'll get into dialogue about it. So I'm going to turn everything over to you, Greg. Lovely. Thank you, John. Brendan, super glad that you're here. I'm really excited about today. Um, so let's just do a quick, quick synopsis. So transcendent naturalism is uh, trying to articulate a new worldview that holds uh, science and spirituality, orients us towards a frame of understanding uh, for the 21st century that can enable kind of a collective uh, orientation toward wisdom. Um, what John and I have done in the first four uh, episodes is lay what we call a, sort of the uh, groundwork for the, the structure of what such a sort of metaphysical, ontological, epistemological picture looks like that's grounded in a natural science view uh, that says, hey, what do we need to have natural science be present in the world? Um, and what does it say? Um, in that, we lay out the notion that there's a leveled ontology uh, to the world um, and that our cognitive structures uh, must be organized in a particular way that grip that. Uh, so this is sort of the conforming principle um, and this gives us a metaphysics that's quite different than a reductive mechanical materialism that emerged out of sort of the first wave of the Enlightenment, as it were. And from that, that situates us uh, to think, uh, I think, in a different way, in some ways about sort of a, a transjective epistemology, one that doesn't exist inside the subject or object per se, uh, but actually exists in a relational context over time. Uh, it's got some lineages, I think, to pragmatism, but both John and I have proposed large scale theories uh, that really are transjective in nature, most notably recursive relevance realization and the behavioral investment theory, influence matrix and justification stuff uh, that I did is also really best conceptualized as a, from a transjective epistemological frame because they don't exist inside the subject or object, but are actually iterative in relation. Um, and ultimately then from there, we're looking for uh, what might be an orientation toward uh, collectively toward the sacred and the opportunity for what might be a strong transcendence uh, by which we're thinking sy systematically about what is the grip of the knower under the known and what potentials does that afford? Not just for us to feel better about our psyches, that's sort of a weak transcendence is, hey, we can make small m meaning and feel okay before we die. Um, but more collectively, we can waken to the moment that we're in, sort of a chirotic moment between worlds. Um, and there's a collective opportunity and a collective danger, I think, uh, existentially, meaning-making wise. Um, and so a strong tension that points to the possibility of sort of a collective awakening toward wisdom and what that would mean for society, for our relationships, for our relationships with the planet. Um, and then what we transitioned to was an uh, uh, excellent set of uh, two conversations, two episodes with Rich uh, Blundell uh, and Rita Ledoux, uh, Leduc, and they are emphasizing oika, which is uh, a philosophically Rich Blundell's view of sort of an economic ecology that is deeply anchored into sort of a big history naturalism, um, which argues for an ontological continuity both uh, with regards to the history of the universe and with regards to our own participation in it and how to waken up to that. So it's really this sort of natural, spiritual, natural intelligence awakening that he uh, emphasized. And he is bridged with Rita, who is an artist, uh, and showed ways that she sort of opened up windows to the natural world that called our sort of pre-adapted um, cognitive structures to connect to that world, to awaken to that world, to feel a part of that world. And so the, their work is showing sort of how uh, sort of a big history naturalism bridges an embodied experience of the world to the artistic uh, landscape and shows, I think, in my in my estimation, really a scientific humanistic bridge. Um, and today, sort of, we want to continue some of that bridge building with science and spirituality, meaning making and cultivating an understanding of the sacred. And uh, we think you're the right guy for it, Brendan. So uh, let me go ahead and 
turn it over to you with that backdrop and welcome you and, and all the wonderful work you've done in metamodern spirituality, emergentism, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So welcome, Brendan. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then uh, the floor is yours to uh, share uh, your perspective as, as we begin to sync up here. Cool. Well, yeah, thank you so much. This is really exciting. Um, I've been engaging with both of your work for a while, so this is really cool to be able to uh, do some of this in real time. Um, yeah, I, I've been working in uh, under the umbrella of metamodern spirituality, trying to do something very akin to, I think, the, the project before us, which is trying to engage spirituality within a naturalistic frame and to do so in a way that takes seriously the, um, the developments of modern and postmodern thought to find a trying to find a kind of uh what Greg you call a integrative coher uh, coherent uh you know integrative pluralism basically that can bring together these multiple uh ways of viewing the world and the the genuine insights that they have um and trying to do spirituality and engagement with the sacred in in a manner that's not uh, reactionary or regressive or uh sort of eschews the incredible insights that have been afforded to us by uh modern and postmodern development so um, yeah, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, I was so excited watching the the previous conversations with with both of you. There's so much um, overlap in uh, my current explorations of these topics. So I, I'm really uh, appreciate the opportunity to get into some of that today. Um, and so yeah, without further ado, I guess let's let's kind of just jump into it. Um, I want to uh, I'll basically try to. Uh, carry forward a lot of the argumentation that's already been presented, uh, synthesize it a bit, and try to extend it into uh, uh, maybe a, a, an additional register. Um, I guess I should also probably mention my background is in religious studies, um, and so there's a lot I'm coming to um, in this sort of conversation that's that's trying to engage interpretations of the sacred and and religion from this perspective. So um, that is sort of where I want to begin to really move the conversation is into uh, uh, considerations of transcendence and the sacred and meaning making at the human level. But to do that, um, I'm really excited to try to ground this first in a lot of the, the work that you've already sort of done. So I'll reiterate a few things, but I will um, kind of try to make a, a thread that we can carry through here. So excellent. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's start. So um, I want to start with kind of some philosophical uh, kind of where, where philosophy, metaphysics, science all kind of seem to meet, which is uh, this issue that came up in episode one around basically sameness and difference um, in, the, in the way that this relates to information. Um, so one way of really grounding this uh, that I think is helpful is to think of the entropic universe that we live in as having a sort of tendency towards a sameness. Um, that's what the homogeneity of equilibrium sort of represents is there is a homogeneous sameness and lack of differentiation. Um, and that is a, that's kind of a first principle of the naturalistic universe that we live in. Um, and now what's interesting about that is in order to sort of counter that natural tendency towards homogeneous sameness, you need energy. You need energy to sort of push back against this entropic force and sort of push back against the pull towards equilibrium. Uh, and so in doing that, you create uh, essentially information, right? So if you're thinking about sameness and difference, and, and John talked about uh, essential difference in the way that uh, difference is sort of uh, a, a core aspect of what we mean by information. I think it was Gregory Bateson who said, who defined information as a difference that makes a difference. Then we'll get into the ways that these differences have causal power, which is really important. Uh, but basically there's this then intricate relationship between energy and information where you need energy to allow information to exist, so to speak, if we understand information to be the differentiation of things uh, in the face of kind of homogeny uh, and equilibrium. So this already sets us up in the sort of energy information field uh, where we're really kind of grounding this thing. And again, we uh, or you guys talked about how there's this, you know, very intimate relationship between energy and information, uh, and we could maybe explore some of that. But that's sort of where I'm coming at this and that's starting to uh, explore these ideas. So um, now we can kind of move into what uh, the developments have been in information theory to try to unpack some of this stuff. And John already did a little bit of that, mentioning uh, Eric Hole's work. Um, but I want to throw in the work of uh, uh, David Krakauer of the Santa Fe Institute, who has an idea called information theory of individuality. Um, and basically, it's a similar sort of idea, right? So uh, Shannon's you know, kind of uh, seminal articulation of information theory presented this idea that information is what is sort of accurately conveyed uh, 
by a signal to a receiver. Um, if you can show that this sort of signal has been received and it's the same one that was sent, then we can call that information. And uh, and this is sort of um, that's sort of essentially what you get uh, from Shannon information theory is is you're you're re removing any sense of what things are about. It's not information about something. It's just information that is conveyed. And if it's conveyed accurately and successfully, then it's it's information. And of course, that all that also faces entropic breakdown. And so you need to build in those redundancies, as John was talking about. Uh, and that was sort of the core, you know grounding idea of information theory that's given us all this incredible uh, information technology, et cetera. It's been incredibly successful theory, but there've been some really fascinating developments to it uh, in recent years. And one of them is this information theory of individuality, which grounds some of this stuff. So um, one of the th ways of thinking about this now is that uh, if you go back to this idea of inf differentiation and sameness, you can think about information as kind of creating uh, uh, what Krakauer calls the figure ground distinction, right? Mm -hmm. You're getting a separation, you're getting, you're getting well, differentiation, right? And so you're creating mm -hmm. sort of a figure and ground distinction that essentially gives you an entity within a broader context. You have mm -hmm. figure, you have ground, you have mm -hmm. entity, and you have environment, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a very core dynamic, which I, I'm going to try to argue is really the grounds of transjectivity uh, and a lot mm -hmm. of other important uh, ideas around information processing. So mm -hmm. anyway, you get this, uh, the, the, the theory of, of the information theory of individuality basically says that once you get this sort of um, distinction, this differentiation, an individual entity can be understood as sort of this communication of the information about that entity over time. And again, some of this is already in that work of whole that, that John mentioned. Um, but in this theory, you can kind of think about this at multiple levels. There's the information about the entity conveyed to itself through time. There's the information of the environment conveyed over time. And crucially, there's the information linking entity to environment. Uh, mm -hmm. that has a statistical significance in terms of you can understand things about the entity by having information about the environment and vice versa. And this mm -hmm. is called mutual information. Mm -hmm. So there's an essential uh, you know, link. Well, I, it's dangerous to use words like essential uh, when you're around philosophers. But so uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily mean it in that sense. But there's a really profound mm -hmm. and important link between information uh, linking entities and their environments. And you can think about understanding the individuality of particular entities as this sort of informational uh, exchange through time and with environments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one important development. Now, the mm -hmm. next thing I want to throw in here is this idea uh, developed by folks like uh, Artemy Kolchinsky, David Walpert, and Carlo Rivelli. Yeah. And I talked a little bit about this in my um, uh, Reality of Meaning uh, presentation that I got into uh, at the Consilience Conference. Uh, mm -hmm. But I want to unpack some of those ideas here because they're really, I think, kind of core and fundamental. Okay. So um, the idea here is that now that we have this idea of mutual information, where entities exist in environments, and there's a kind of statistical link between these things, and we have mutual information, uh, we can move past the Shannon uh, issue of information not being about anything. Mm -hmm. Because now we can actually see that entities uh, do have... Um, there, there's information for entities that has intrinsic meaning to them, okay? So entities need energy from their environment to persist uh, in order to maintain their informational integrity over time. Um, and so basically, the mutual information that causally links entities to the energy in their environment that allows them to do that has an intrinsic existential sort of uh, meaning uh, to mm. those entities. So mm -hmm. because of that mutual information linking entities to environments and the energetic information uh, connection, mm -hmm. there's an intrinsic aboutness to some information that is mm. not just, you know, something we can assess sort of, uh, oh, well, in, a message was conveyed accurately or not. It's actually mm -hmm. about something. It actually has meaning to that entity mm. in its context. And this is genuine semantic in information. Yes. So not just the syntactic mm -hmm. information of, mm -hmm. of Shannon. So now mm -hmm. we've got information that's about things. And this is, I, I think, kind of where I want to begin really grounding all this, because um, huh. basically they call this meaning. Uh, this is sort of the, the core sense of what meaning might be. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, it's a very kind of... Uh, it's a very bare sense of meaning. It's a very simple sense of meaning. But we have this sort of abstract notion that entities exist in environments based on an entropic universe and needing energy to maintain their informational integrity over time, uh, and that those energy those entities need to then successfully acquire that information to maintain themselves over time. And the ability to which they're able to do that 
uh, is what enhances or uh, or or delimits or, or or is deleterious to their viability. That is mm. meaning to entities. Mm. Um, mm. Now, okay, so that's sort of the the core premise that I want to kind of now build up into this really important idea of where does transcendence and a leveled ontology um, exist in in all of this. So uh, I also want to note something that they write in their paper, which I think will probably you know prick John's ears up because they say, uh, and here's a little quote I wrote down: "There is a connection between." Paying attention to the right information as measured by semantic efficiency and being thermodynamically efficient, which mm -hmm. is basically a form of relevance realization yes. at the level of information energy yep. exchange, right? Yes. So you have to know what's relevant and what's meaningful to you. And if you don't, then you're basically facing potential entropic yep. uh, annihilation, okay? Yes. So uh, now I want to kind of contextualize recursive relevance realization at a particular level of that leveled ontology, but it's based, I think, on this fundamental notion that we can ground in, in energy and information. So what we've done, I think, hopefully so far, meaning equals information relevant to enhancing viability of an entity in context. Uh, mm -hmm. And meaning is inherently transjective then. It's not in the subject, mm -hmm. it's not in the object, it's yep. in the relationship between yep. the two. So now I want to synthesize some ideas from Bobby Azarian, uh, mm -hmm. who wrote a great book called The Romance of Reality. Um, and he basically picks up on this notion. Uh, he calls it knowledge. OK, so they call it meaning. He calls it knowledge. But it's information processed in this particular way. And the argument he makes is that there's a learning process involved then in the very nature of complexification and cosmic evolution, um, because entities are always basically seeking information to maintain and enhance their viability. Um, and basically, this is the origin of sort of adaptive responses in you know, oh. the face of environmental information. And this leads to more complex structures, uh, which then lead to you know, more differentiation, which needs you know, more energy to maintain that informational difference. And thus, mm -hmm. there's a kind of virtuous cycle that builds on itself. So mm -hmm. um, we've got a learning process. Uh, a, a, a meaning making process, and it's all grounded in a kind of particular energy information framework. Um, mm -hmm. So that's where I want to now plug in all the work that you've both done over this series. Uh, John's incredible, helpful, uh, philosophical underlaboring, as, as Greg put it. Um, and I want to throw in the UTOC framework now to bring this into that level, because John's made some incredible kind of uh, philosophical, um, you know, claims for situating these ideas in kind of a, a, a very robust uh, kind of rational structure. And then mm -hmm. Greg comes in with the UTOC thing and it's sort of like, okay, here's some specificity around what are these levels in this leveled ontology. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is now very important because as Greg points out, these levels, matter, life, mind, and culture are distinguished by novel information processing systems of increasing complexity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can start to see what might emerge from all these things coming together uh, mm -hmm. so, all right, basically, you know, matter, we've got this frozen energetic memory, and then we get to life, which is processing genetic information. Mind is processing neuronal information and culture is processing symbolic information. And they're stacked over time through this complexification process, which is itself a kind of learning process, uh, unfolding over time. Now, on top of that, Greg's framework also gives us the periodic table of behavior, which he showed, uh, in episode two. And what's really cool about this is that this gives you the entity environment pairings that give you the transjective context of meaning making, right? Mm -hmm. So these are going to be the contexts in which meaning is registered and, in, and knowledge is acquired, basically. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And so with that framework, uh, you basically bring all this together. And what I'm trying to ar argue is that what we have is essentially a tiered structure of increasing increasingly complex learning processes uh, mm. stacked on top of each other over mm -hmm. the course of cosmic evolution. So matter, mm. I call it kind of structural learning, and you can get into mm -hmm. dissipative structures and adaptation and that sort of thing to see uh, people like Terrence Deacon have even recognized that there's uh, a sort of um, a, a, a teleological or a, a, yeah, te te teleonomical sort of yeah. aspect to, to these sorts of things, right? An intentional quality, even at the level of, of pre prebiotic material. Um, but certainly this becomes a lot clearer once you get into the life register where you're getting mm -hmm. genetic learning. And Bobby mm -hmm. Azarian makes a great case for uh, seeing evolution as basically a learning process using genetic mm -hmm. coding. Then you mm -hmm. get into the cognitive learning uh, layer of all this. Mm -hmm. And then, John, this is where I really plug in your work very much because your whole framing of recursive relevance realization is, I think, basically uh, where this framework 
fits in the tiered uh, sort of, yeah, you know, leveling ontology, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you're specifically right. focused on uh, neuronal entities processing information about their environment for relevance and meaning. Uh, but that's occurring at the level you need, you know, a complex nervous system to be able to process that kind of information. Um, but just to, to be able to connect that to this really grand process as it sort of goes up the entire, uh, you know, cosmic evolutionary complexification chain is very cool. Um, mm -hmm. And then the last one at the culture plane, you're talking about symbolic information. I call it symbolic learning. And that's really what I kind of want to focus on here mm. to try to bring this a little bit into the religious register and to focus mm. on the sacred and the spiritual. Um, and actually, yeah. can I, yeah. can I just pause you and just, yeah, by um, uh, I feel just, I, I want to make a comment about the congruence of what you just laid out there. Um, I mean, one of the things that I really like the entity field, uh, I really like the energy information mapping. Uh, I like the stacking. I, I think that, that basically, you know, I, I'm feeling you feel your way into information, into meaning and connecting the dots in a particular way that feels uh, very synergistic, adding some richness and detail and also very congruent. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Also, let me know if I'm going too fast or, you know, mm -hmm. just I can slow down and or whatever. Also, I wanted to say, too, I want to say this up front. Um, I want to be challenged and critiqued and I want the, all these things to be broken apart too. So, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I'm working with this. I'm about 350 pages deep into a book trying to explore these topics. And so, uh, yeah, I'd love this to be a, a really, you know, uh, uh, something that can allow me to deepen this and, and correct for any, any, uh, you know, failures of, of thought here. So, uh, by all means do that. Um, sure. okay. So, yeah. So basically what, what I want to kind of where this sets us up for is, is if it's not kind of clear by now, is that we're we're getting a picture in which meaning itself evolves, meaning mm -hmm. complexifies, um, and so do values. Um, because, uh, and I, uh, if you're talking about structures and their learning environments and the positions in which they're processing information uh, for viability, those things have intrinsic value to the existence of entities and context, right? So whenever mm -hmm. you're talking about meaning, there is an implicit sense of normativity in the sense of, and I think Deacon yes. mentions this at one point, where basically if there is a, an implicit sort of goal state, then, and, and that can be successfully or not successfully, um, you know, uh, moved closer mm -hmm. to, then you have normativity mm -hmm. in the mix. And so once you have to have some basis of normativity, you have a sense of value already in the mix as well. And I think that's really important, too, when we're talking about conversations of meaning and meaning complexifying through time and over the stack, uh, because normativity and and uh, and value uh, is part of that uh, idea that that's evolving. Um, so, did you did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I did. I, I'll do this if I, if I sure. want your attention. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to uh, emphasize what uh, what Greg say. I'm kind of humbled by this. Uh, what you're doing. Uh, it's really impressive. Um, and it uh, it resonates. Yeah. Uh, you know, the way I've tried to connect using Evan's, Evan Thompson's idea, deep continuity relevance realization to autopoiesis. And then autopoiesis goes down into mm -hmm. uh, self-organization. And that's uh, uh, Alicia Urrero, who has, who, whose new book is out, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, um, but the, the thing I wanted to ask, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm I'm sort of silenced by by this. I just want to go like, yeah, just keep going. Uh, but I have a, a question emerges, and it, it goes towards uh, well, some of the stuff I was talking about, especially when I moved in, when we move into the religious register. So you you made the argument that I agree with that meaning is complexifying, and it, it in itself is evolving, and that uh, and you know an evolution is a kind of learning, and relevance realization is a, like evolution, and there's all that deep continuity um and so that means that its capacity to disclose aspects of reality is mm -hmm. also evolving right it's getting a more and more optimal grip on reality so what i mean by that is that as the meaning goes up the disclosure of being also mm -hmm. goes up yes um in a completely correlational manner this is one of plotinus's main arguments and claims and uh, I think we've circled back to the place where we can give mm -hmm. um, a, a, a a scientific framework for that. Uh, so first of all, you, you're nodding. You agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I think that that is what uh, what what's very powerful about understanding this as a learning process. I mean, if we mm -hmm. take learning seriously, that's what we hope. 
we are doing when we are learning is learning more about reality. More of reality is becoming disclosed to us. We gain a more optimal grip on it, et cetera. Uh, it increases our causal power, et cetera. So um, yes, 100%. And uh, and, and that yeah. more is uh, just to make sure that make clear that more is not just a quantitative more, it's a qualitative more, given Greg's argument about novelty in forms of information processing. So there's a novelty moreness, not just a, a quantitative mm -hmm. moreness. It, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that means that you know, human beings have an ontological significance because, uh, right, they may not be causally significant in the universe because they're infinitesimal specks against the, you know, billions and billions of galaxies, as Carl Sagan would say, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the, the aspects of being that are disclosed by them mm. is, 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 you know, uh, you know uh, I, I want to say something like at the summit. Uh, yeah. Huh. Right. I like to say uh, Earth burns like a quasar of complexification in the night sky. So mm. if our if our measure is mass, then yes. But if our measure is complexification, especially a ontic epistemic conformity that affords awareness, experience, potentiality, growth, uh, oriented towards a potential future, et cetera, that is a that is a, an area in which we, you know, uh, find ourselves quite uniquely situated, I believe, in the universe, at least in terms of the everyday knowledge that we have of things in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I would throw into that, um, right, you, we have some metrics uh, around these sorts of things in terms of like, there's a wonderful book, Cosmic Evolution. Uh, uh, I was gonna say pretty famous, but I guess it's famous in these circles, I think, um, uh, by uh, Eric Chazon about mm -hmm. the um, basically using energy rate density to map complexification right. through time. And, uh, and when you do, when you use a metric like that, you're looking at, well, informational richness and energetic, you know, and the energy needed to maintain that informational richness, uh, basically exponentially increasing. And the summit on that uh, on that chart is the human brain and human mm -hmm. cultural production, basically. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if you look at sort of the more reductionistic scientific, uh, scientific uh, framing of, of, of things, we're just, you know, on the pale blue dot, not really of any significance at all. But when you frame this in complexity terms, we don't know of anything more complex than us. So, um, yeah. So, so two more points on that. Sorry, there was, I had to answer a call. Uh, uh, sure, no worries. Um, one is, um, that means that human beings not only possess symbols or make use of symbols, they are themselves in symbols, right? They have, they themselves are disclosers of reality so there's a kind of participatory knowing in that symbolic mm -hmm. sense. Um, um, so I, I'm doing a review of Tillich right now for a course I'm teaching. And so that sort of Tillichian idea uh, mm -hmm. comes out. We're not just possessors of symbols. Uh, we are we are symbolic of being. Uh, Fiston says something analogous that we, the, you know, we don't have a model. Uh, 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 the, the self doesn't have the model of the world. The self is a model of the world kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. there, there's consonant there. And, and, and then I wanted to say there is perhaps something more complex, which is, of course, the distributed cognition of collective, collective right, that supports mm -hmm. collective yeah. intelligence. Sure. And that would also, if this argument follows, that would also not only possess symbolic grip on the world, it would itself be a more profound symbolic disclosure of being. Um, and I think that's getting us deeply into the religious register as, as soon as we we move from because it, it's very, you know, you can it, the, the enlightenment and, you know, the romantic response. We, you know, yes, we have symbols and we manipulate them. And I think that's leaving out uh, this participatory relation you know, that the way we actually are symbols, yes, both yeah. at the individual and at the collective level. And yeah. that religion is the attempt and not, you know, not without significantly you know significant fails of sig failures of significant moral consequence or anything like that but religion is the attempt uh to enter into uh like a a, a a a proper participation in that symbolic disclosure to be a symbol either individually and collectively and i and, and i just wanted to throw that into the mix and see how that landed for you um, yes. So there's a couple things uh, that come up from that. Uh, I'll, I'll address the main part after this little first little uh, 
aspect, which is just that the causal power is an interesting thing to consider because on the one hand, yes, from the scope of the universe, human beings inhabit this tiny little planet, you know, yeah. what have you. Um, but if you just look at sort of the framework of what we see that um, we are able to accomplish with symbolic learning and mm -hmm. how much causal power that unleashes for mm -hmm. uh, human beings, um, mm -hmm. you know, I guess I just wanted to point that out, at least at the level of scope yeah. of, uh, and, and also to note that we don't know where that's going yet. History is evolving no. and time is unfolding. And, uh, so, you know, folks like Bobby Azarian see us eventually having, and others too, uh, see us having a much grander causal, uh, impact on the broader mm -hmm. universe. Uh, but certainly within our local level, we can see that. Um, but as for, um, the symbolic aspect. This is really crucial. And this is a big, it, I take up a lot of time in, in this thing I'm working on to really unpack this because uh, mm -hmm. I can, I can, I can get at this actually through Greg's framework, I think pretty well, because uh, he talks about justification systems. And basically you can think about what we are doing with symbolic information as coming up with justification symbols across different scales. Now mm -hmm. that's a nonlinear process as well, because we get enculturated using symbolic justification systems. So mm -hmm. we are both um, updating the symbolic justification systems through our learning processes. And then we are enculturating the next members of, of society using those updated mental models and so on and so forth. So um, there's a way in which we really need to understand individuals as being networked into uh, symbolic processing um, systems, mm -hmm. however you want to think about that. It's very mm -hmm. important because we're not atomized individuals. Uh, we are, my individuality, my self-consciousness is formed by means of symbolic information that I get, you know, mm -hmm. so there's this really important relationship between what are called collective representations in sociology and the kinds of like egoic identity structures right. that we form. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but that's really, that's really crucial. Um, so that, that, we are all that and, mm -hmm. and those things exist in a kind of transpersonal way. And then the last thing I want to say too, is Greg, to your whole model as well, um, I think you can... Uh, if you look at the periodic table, you're kind of seeing that each of those um, kind of columns becomes a way of networking, you know, mm -hmm. columns together, right? And so what Definitely. you get with symbolic information is essentially the networking of neural nets or minds together, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. symbolic information Definitely. is a way of bringing together minds uh, in a way that we're able to speak with each other. And where we're headed, of course, is now with the distributed cognition of, you know, AI and whatnot, we've networked mm -hmm. symbolic information into a way that we're now engaging with. And so that process, you know, again, kind of iterates and continues. But anyway. Yeah. We're yeah. Gonna... Well, let me let me just uh, speak to that because that's I 100% agree not to, you know, we can certainly disagree, but, uh, but I do agree. Uh, the way what for me emerged with justification systems theory is the human psychological level. Uh, so we'll get together and all of my own justifications egoically, a family will develop a justification system. And at the same time, that's then nested in what I call the large scale systems of justification provide the superstructure that legitimize uh, sort of magistrates to regulate institutionalized technological structures. And so there's this iterative nested element of a human psychology situated in a socio anthropological political large scale system. And there's this constant iterative forces, you know, you get somebody like Hitler uh, at a particular point and you get an individual that then is creating a broadcast function that can creates a collective. Um, this is so central to me uh, in the center of the tree of life is this meme flower. And it's got a big metaphysical empirical where the empirical is the data through the metaphysicals, the concepts and categories that represents the large scale and around it is each of the small, small is each individual. And it's this iterative process between self and society. Mm. And you're absolutely right that we get socialized in to become conventional. And then so individuals become post-conventional, press the edges. And we see that nested yeah. iterative process. And ultimately, when John and I, I think, are talking about strong transcendence, it is what is the ingredients in relationship to these large scale systems and how do they embed participation collectively yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to create sort of the collective epistemic that opens up potentialities uh, in, in the world.
Yeah. So on the, on this front, and I think this will kind of tie these things together. Um, okay. So there's great work. Uh, Brett Anderson's doing it. And, um, yep. you know, I'm trying to do some of this stuff as well is bringing into some of this conversation ideas around worldviews, chaos and order, and the kind of process that undergoes with, you know, uh, in the kind of archetypal, what we think of the great stories and what they're doing uh, in the hero's journey and that sort of a thing. Basically going into the unknown, the chaotic, the entropic, and then coming, coming back into the world with something that sort of, uh, well, enhances viability, right? For the collective again, you're sort of mm. saving the world from entropic breakdown by reaching into chaos and coming back into order, but then you've extended that front of order and chaos mm. and that sort of critical edge and you get that's, you know, the complexity advance. So John, to your point about the disclosure of more reality, that's it. I mean, right. If we live, if you kind of want to use the metaphor image of there's this void of chaos and, and sort of chaotic, uh, you know, entropic, you could even think of it as, you know, homogenous equilibrium uh, and and the kind of, you know, penetration of that into um, the unknown. Um, and then and then where that becomes restructured in a way that can uh, basically become intelligible, right, yes. at a higher level mm -hmm. of complexity, you've made a transcendent leap. And that's what mm -hmm. we're doing when we're leveling up in our worldviews, which is where I was, exactly. I'm going to kind of get to next in this yeah. basic idea. But it's a really lovely way of thinking about it. Um, and I'll, so, I'll just, yeah, I'll put one more thing on that because I think, uh, I'm actually going to be talking with him later this week, Michael Levin in his really yeah. interesting work on sort of exploration of morphological biophysiological space, uh, uses the term, I would call it a biocognitive light cone for that level. But basically what he's saying is there's a, there's an attractor state that this thing can move toward. Mm. And then we can think about the radius of that light cone across a number of different levels. And I would say we're looking at a, the radius of a biopsychosocial or living mental cultural, and then maybe more kind of light cone in relation. And the radius of that is some of what we're talking about. Mm. And the collective intelligence of a capacity would be sort of the highest radiance you know, we can imagine God or as really holding the, you know, the, the imaginal uh, radius of, uh, that that we're aspiring to. So that yeah. that is just another kind of angle that I think uh, corresponds and aligns very closely with what we we're uh, talking about here. Yeah. Well, so yeah, this this kind of brings me into the next slash. I think maybe more or less last part of this whole thing that I was going to lay out. But I'm also this is mm -hmm. good. This is really uh, good to have this back and forth. Um, so I could just jump into that, or we could keep yeah, working please. on these. No, okay. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so yeah, so this is, I think maybe more of the novel stuff that I want to throw into the mix here. Um, because, um, what I'm trying to do a lot is zero in on the symbolic complexification front, which is going to mean looking at culture, um, and how, yeah, essentially the learning process has un unfolded through culture and disclosed more of reality in the way that we're talking about, uh, kind of creating iterative transcendent moves, um, and, we, and actually, I wasn't even going to get into this, but I'm glad we did because it's really important. There's a really important uh, mechanism for understanding that process, which I'm calling the individual collective feedback cycle, which is what we were just getting at, which is that these symbolic mm -hmm. ideas get generated, they enculturate, but then people kind of push the boundaries of that. And then you wind up sort of getting a, a gradual distributional shift in symbolic complexification over time. And that's a way of understanding kind of cultural evolution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, I know Dan Chappie and I have been going through Brandom um, and especially uh, reason and philosophy and spirit of trust. Um, mm. And I mean, th this is basically his take on Hegel. This is mm. what he's, mm. this is what he says Hegel yep. was actually proposing. Mm. And when you get mm. out of sort of the, you know, the first appraisal of Hegel, put it in this very pseudo religious, uh, you know, deep, uh, and then you take it out and you put it into this language yeah. of intelligibility and rationality. And we are responsible uh to pro, you know, to uh, uh, to um, uh, how things have been prioritized in the past, we're responsible to the future. Like, we, so our, our 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 acts of justification, to use Greg's language, are precedent respecting, and they try to be precedent setting. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we're doing this very thing, uh, and it and the, and then of course that and how reality is disclosed through that is Geist uh, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Hegel yeah. in a powerful mm -hmm. way. Yes. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, uh, so uh, reading Habermas has been really influential for ah, me on all this. So, yep. um, right. So, so basically, right. You, you get, you get, 
Hegel talking about dialectics, and then you get Marx doing dialectical materialism, which in some ways mm -hmm. is a really important move, right? Because we've got to naturalize this thing, right? Yeah, but of mm -hmm. course, Hegel, I'm sorry, too, Marx is too simplistic. It basically makes uh, all of culture just sort of a superstructure to economic uh, means of production. So then Habermas comes around and, and does a reconstruction of dialectical materialism, and he mm -hmm. grounds it on uh, the kinds of learning processes that yeah. I'm talking about yeah. and communicative yeah, yeah. action and this sort of thing. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's very consonant with what Brandom is doing, right? That's exactly right. what Brandom's project. And it's very consonant with justification systems theory. In fact, Brandon yeah. talks about justification and the Habermas's structure, which I didn't know about when I came because I was ignorant. But when I learned about Habermas's frame, I was like, oh my gosh, I sh should have been more uh, aware of this, but enormous amounts of consonants there. Yeah. So, so then what I, I'm really interested by is trying to get uh, into this with some specificity, right? It's one yeah. thing to kind of recognize some broad patterns and trends but then it's like is there a way to measure this or something like that right hmm. I and mean, we talked about you know energy or free energy rate density and that sort of a thing and there are other uh metrics or uh, uh, you know attempted metrics for complexification at different uh, mm -hmm. you know levels of the stack but what would that look like in the symbol uh, symbolic information processing so here i I'm, i've been very influenced by daniel gortz's work or hansi freinacht um mm -hmm. and bringing it and i also mentioned uh hopper moss and others who are basically using learning models uh to think about this process and you know one of the great educational uh, pedagogical thinkers of the 20th century and epistemologists was uh piaget um, mm -hmm. and, and when you look at, so Habermas is using Piaget's models essentially, and what comes from that and Kohlberg and that sort of moral development, that mm -hmm. sort of a thing, but a lot of work's been done in, uh, on those fronts over the past 30, 40 years. Right. So you get this neo Piagetian or post Piagetian yeah, yeah. consensus. Yes, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. actually Greg uh, intuited this when you were talking about level ontology, he, he, at mm -hmm. one point was like, oh, MHC and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very interesting mm -hmm. way. So what I, what I'm looking at is this, if you look at, um, these models, models of hierarchical complexity. And the two I'm particularly drawing from are Commons's model of hierarchical complexity. Yep. And then there's another one called uh, dynamic skill theory, which basically, you know, it creates sure. mm -hmm. sort of consensus. Yep. They're basically mapping the same uh, levels mm -hmm. of hierarchical complexity. Um, now, part of the Piaget and epistemological program is that our knowledge kind of comes out of the body in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, but what I kind of focus on, so there are a number of those stages of hierarchical complexity that are basically just purely sensory motor, right? And Piaget mm -hmm. identified that in the early yeah. process. Once you get language in the mix, though, then you're dealing with purely kind of symbolic uh, <laughs> hierarchical complexity. So mm -hmm. in my work, I'm sort of synthesizing those two models of hierarchical complexity, lopping off the sensory motor bit and just looking at the linguistic complexification, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, okay. of basically mm -hmm. symbolic information. So that mm -hmm. gives us sort of 10 or so what I call symbolic complexity grades um, mm -hmm. of just thinking about how this works. And then we have an actual pattern that's in many ways empirically grounded and also theoretically and mathematically mm -hmm. even very mm -hmm. robust to think about how symbolic information complexification uh, unfolds and what that looks mm -hmm. like. Huh. Now, I, I mentioned um, uh, Gortz uh, mm -hmm. and, and Freinach's work because they are doing some really interesting things around looking at cultural history in the way Habermas and others were doing through this mm -hmm. kind of learning process. And mm. when you do that, you see a learning, the, the, the learning patterns that we see in these hierarchical models of complexity uh, are, become manifested in the collective representations of cultures over time. And mm. so this gets us into the main thrust I want to argue, which is that at this point now we're dealing with ideas of religion, spirituality, uh, you know, institutional frameworks, God, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. whole thing that I'm very fascinated in and trying to bring my biblical studies background to as well mm. is looking at the very ways that God and religion complexify and evolve. Mm. Uh, mm. And of course, with all the value mm -hmm. normative frameworks that go along with that. Um, so I can actually just do one thing real quick, and then I'll kind of wrap up my little uh, spiel, is that what we're doing right now can be situated in this sort of learning process, a cultural huh. symbolic process, right? If you want to mm -hmm. think about the two worlds mythologies that we get from the axial age, the move mm -hmm. into modern reductionism, which John really, you know, well summarized at the beginning of the series, and then this attempt to try to bridge into some kind of transcendent naturalism, et cetera, right? You can see this process unfolding uh, culturally in terms of mm. the symbolic complexification thing. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you know, you know, the axial age is this 
cultural movement into uh, MHC um, abstract stage thinking, where you get the abstraction mm. uh, from the stories and this sort of thing. And then you get the universal one, you know, you get the yeah. uh, the abstract yeah. conceptual and all this stuff, the immaterial other world, right? So in many ways, you can read the entire axial age shift through this learning process development that goes on in this sort of leveling up of collective representations according to a new uh, level of symbolic complexity. Now, that is sacred, right? That was sacred for that mm. world. And that was the that was the locus of the engaging with transcendence. And if you look at where the world had come from, it was, you know, dominated by, yeah, basically empires and, you know, kind of master slave dialectic sort of stuff. So then to jump from that into a uh, deep moral uh, interior landscape and a world of the abstract and the the mm. uh, the transcendent, this is a this is a leveling up process that is rightly deemed sacred uh, mm -hmm. because it is disclosing something more about reality. It is yep. part of this learning process, and it is perceived as a, as a, as an experience of transcendence. And now, when you get into sort of the the dawn of modernity and the advent of modern science, you're dealing with the next stage of hierarchical complexity or for, full formal operational thought, which is all about linking basically abstract variables into finding sets of relationships and doing that and studying the world that way. And you start to get this mechanistic universe. And of course, that does go in 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 many uh, kind of almost pathological directions, or at least uh, uh, maybe potentially destructive ones for for all mm -hmm. sorts of meaning making. But at the same time, there's a sense in which what what's sacred becomes the truth and the, mm. the question for knowledge and the you know the sort of uh mm. notions of progress etc anyway I, if i had more time i could go into yeah. mm -hmm. looking at more of cultural history this way but i think what we're really doing us right now in this broader kind of metamodern scene i think is trying to do that next step now i missed mm. postmodernism in there but you know mm -hmm. you go from modernity to postmodernity, and now we're entering this new thing and we are in this sort of meta systematic vantage where we're taking into account all these different systems of knowledge. We're trying to see the meta systematic through line that unites them all. And we're also trying to integrate the insights of all those so that we've got, you know, the best of, well, I think you called it the sweet juiciness of the two worlds mythology, uh, John, <laughs> or something like that. We want to bring yeah. that in, right? But we also want the modern uh, skepticism or the modern rationalism. And we yeah. want the postmodern pluralism. And we want to be able to see a meta narrative that unfolds through all of this so anyway uh yeah th that's my basic gist is that this has been a successive layering of kind of further disclosures of reality at uh -huh. higher levels of symbolic complexification and of course then this starts to tap into issues of you know the fifth joint point and whatnot but we can understand the sacred and transcendence as being that call to complexify that call to level up into new disclosures of reality, new levels of learning and understanding about reality that give us a more optimal grip and enhance our viability uh, in the universe. So that's kind of my, huh. my take. That was great. Uh, uh -huh. But I, so I want to, I want to draw you out on one point. You, you, yeah. you sort of, uh, you did a, an updated and improved version of the Durkheimian thesis that, you know, this gets taken up into collective representations, God, etc. cetera. Um, and there's Vygotsky counterpointing Piaget. There's the top down of uh, yeah. culture mm. right with the bottom up of sensory motor um and so all of that um uh, it, it was, was 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 you 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 tapped on it but what what i then what i what was expecting after you just made that sentence is i was as i was expecting something like and this call should be a call to exactly an evolution of the sacred and again i'm i'm in the midst of redoing tillich for a course so this is the god above the god of theism right mm -hmm, that call mm -hmm. yeah. that if this argument is correct mm -hmm. and we are in this particular uh 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 chirotic moment then this is not just you know a revision of how we understand ourselves or even reality it is a fundamental um way in which we are trying to afford and be receptive to a new disclosure yes. of the sacred a new yes. way in which god can uh, B, um, which sounds, of course, ridiculous, but uh, yeah. but that's no. exactly what Tillich is at the end of the Courage to Be, right? He's proposing, right, in, in the God above the God of theism, or as I sometimes say, the God beyond God. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, is that fair to 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 lob that back at you and see see? Yeah, see I mean, of course. Know. I mean, my way into this whole project was through that lens, basically. Uh, yeah. And so I now I'm kind of coming back to. To the whole theoretical foundations of a project like that but that is where this 
uh, comes to in many different ways. I mean, so Tillich, right? I mean, you, you, he, he, the idea of ultimate concern is itself a version of doing a move like that, right? It's it like, is. What is it God, is. right? It's yeah, well, yeah, it, yeah. So you're yeah. you're moving actually in Fowler. I didn't mention, but uh, Fowler, who's doing something similar, talking about stages of faith, faith and this sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. He uses a phrase, ultimate environment. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I like that as well, because entities environments are looking in some ways for that ultimate environment that will be yeah, uh, yeah. maximally viability enhancing. And so um, but but more to your point, um, yes, one of the I mean, we could really there's a lot to this whole thing, but I, I guess briefly, I would say this, I think, sets up a participatory aspect to uh, to the religious life in a way that's not. Um, you know, an, an inheritance of traditional yeah. praxis and belief, but an actual generative, uh, co-creative process. Yeah. Um, because collectively, I mean, and John, this is our earlier conversations, right, with layman and whatnot. Getting yes, into some exactly. of this is is where this really leads to is that um, once you realize that okay, we're working with inherited world models, basically, which are these worldviews of shared collective representations for navigating the world, and they're no longer adequate to meet the the needs of the moment. We need to level up. There's an existential chirotic element to that. And so, and we need to do that together, but we also need to do it at a personal level and basically be networking yeah. our shared yep. personal yep. representations of this sort of a thing. So that's like, when I th talk about building the cathedral, that's the whole mm. idea, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. Developing a personal mythology, uh, def uh, engaging in the mythopoeic activity uh, that we see our symbols, right? But we were able to sort of network together and to then make possible new forms of thought, which are we're going to need if we're going to more optimally uh, navigate our environment towards viability. And, mm. and that's sort of what you're talking about and what you've been talking about in other conversations I've seen and I've participated in. That dovetails with what Rita was talking about uh, last very time. Very much so. Very much, very much so. Uh, and it also it also gets to the dangers too that that, yes. that that were mentioned at the outset, right? Because um because anytime you enter the chaotic to look for that next level of transcendence, you're in the realm of chaos. You're in the underworld. Mm -hmm. You're in the uh, you could be swallowed by the by the dragon, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, there's danger here, uh, and that can lead to destructive cults. It can lead to you know all sorts of things, right? Um, I think one of the challenges of the moment is how do we how do we situate uh, this whole narrative in some ways that we're telling as mm -hmm. optimally and coherently as possible. So it becomes a kind of intuitive groundwork for people to engage this while also with a built-in epistemic humility, because you realize that there's this transcendent process that's sort of yep. iterative and you're not getting the absolute final necessarily. You're getting, right. you're getting the next step. And so there's all sorts of really important sort of uh, checks and balances that need to be part of a, pro a project like that. But it is the urgent, I think, kind of religious innovation project and uh, that, that we're engaged in. And uh, it's the religion of no religion. It's emergentism, you know, people trying to engage this, but also trying to be wary and responsible to yes. the inherent uh, dangers as well. So there be dragons. So, so, so it seems to me that there's now two things then that also are going to need some sort of reciprocal re-symbolization. Um, one is reason. Um, and we have to get it outside mm -hmm. of the Cartesian framework. Um, mm -hmm. And we've already bumped up against that in, in important ways. And and return reason to, you know, that 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 note or that notion of right, overcoming self-deception and affording reality disclosure in an interlocking mm -hmm. uh, fashion as as the primary thing. Uh, and then, of course, and then that that's going to relate ultimately to wisdom. But I'm thinking also particularly of courage. Uh, again, mm -hmm. uh, right? Because mm -hmm. the, 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 it seems to me that courage properly understood, and we have, of course, in the courage to be an, a huge attempt uh, to rethink that and re and re symbolize it properly. See it as a profound symbol, because courage seems to me to be the virtue uh, that describes exactly what you're talking about. The courageous person mm -hmm. is the one that goes into the chaos, uh, but has the wisdom and uh, the wherewithal to not give, not to go down. Uh, you know the uh, the the rabbit holes, the the self deceptive, self destructive uh, mm. rabbit holes, and then there's something about the two of them being, you know, reason sort of maybe the three, uh, reason, uh, courage, and wisdom, um, mm. all have to be. I mean, we, we are still part of part of what I struggle against is, um, so much of the language by which we understand 
um, reason, uh, courage, and wisdom is either the axial age formulation or the Cartesian modern formulation. Postmodernism basically tries to sort of tear them both down, uh, but it doesn't give an it doesn't really provide an alternative. Mm. Um, it just asserts justice, social justice, in in a, in a really annoying, um, uh, uh, annoying manner. Um, uh, precisely because mere assertion is no protection against exploitation, manipulation, deception, uh, etc. It's no, it's no defense against corruption, mm. right? Right. Well, just be just, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, <laughs> right. So that's that's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm I, all right. I'm, I'm not dismissive of the whole project. I think there's a lot of argument, but that part. So it seems it seems to me to get back after that sort of brushing aside and unnecessary, perhaps an uh, an irrelevant at this moment digression is like it seems to me that we are it's not like i i i i, I you know umberto echo talked about semantic drift i i feel something like epistemic drift so we you know we we have to re-symbolize god but then also reason and then also wisdom mm -hmm. and courage and the self right um and um one thing about that that's positive is we have a model for that from the past, which is religion. Religion does exactly that job and nothing else does that. The things that have tried mm. to do that have been disaster. But the, the problem then is that all the religions we have are mired in. They are the axial age that has been refracted through the Enlightenment and then been corroded or in some sense or, or, or eroded or perhaps is the right word by the encounter mm. with postmodernism. So it, it's like I find that I'm sorry. I, 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 there's a, there's a, like, I think everything you said was beautiful, and then we get to this. What there's a kairos, but I find that there's an aporia in the kairos, mm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a profound aporia. But mm. I keep sort of feel that I'm uh, at times I'm, uh, uh, you know, I think I, I, I do not think that all the work I've done or Greg has done or you've done is a waste of time. I'm not saying that <laughs> at all, right? I'm not. I'm, I'm not being Socrates. And oh, by the way, all the definitions have now collapsed. That's not what I'm doing. But Since I'm, the end of the program, John. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, this was great, guys. Really this was great. Uh, done. TN, that's the end of you. No, no but I, I want to, I, you know, precisely because you have done such an astonishingly good job, Brendan, I want to, I want to I, I probe you about your sense. Do you have such a sense of encountering this aporia, and what is coming up? What is being evoked and provoked in you by encountering this aporia? If if that's not a fair question, you can just no, say no. Great. But it's great. No, it's wonderful. Um, okay, a couple things. And and <laughs> given my own history with kind of deconstructing a lot of uh, my evangelical faith, I'm not usually one to fall on a word like this, but I think it actually is relevant, which is faith, yeah. uh, which is that um, one of the things that I think something like this, uh, this framework helps me with facing that is um, there's a sense of faith that this is this is going to emerge. Uh, it's it's we can do our best, and and we are. I think we're we're doing what we can as individuals in this very complex system. Uh, we're trying to develop new symbols and move the symbolic you know complexity forward. But yeah, it's incredibly paralyzing sometimes to appreciate how how much of just a small little node you are in this yes. very complex network. Um, and so I think. It, to meet that kind of crushing uh, feeling, it, there needs to be an, a, a kind of requisite uh, meeting of that with the courage, uh, the courage of faith. Or I'm mixing yeah. a bunch of tillich together here now. But, no, that's that's fine. That's perfect. Yeah, but but you know you have to sense that okay, if there is this fascinating, beautiful pattern of increasing learning and deepening consciousness. And I didn't even get into this, but I, I, there's a, we, we need to talk about how this is moving towards the good as yes, well. Yes, of um, course, of course. Yes. That, uh, that you have to also own your own, you know, kind of like the Schleier Machian sense of being in the face of the divine. You're just a, a, a to just a, a creature, you know, the creaturely sense of, of, of how big everything is. Uh, and that, but the faith that, this sort of uh, DNA, this code will do what the code does and we'll keep moving the process along. So ah. I, I feel like we just need to do our part in that, um, you know, we're little organelles in the cell and without us, the cell would fall apart, but we're not, 
you know, that, that's the whole beauty in some ways of complexity. It's like, it's all about the parts, but then it's also all about the whole and the parts are just playing their part for the whole. And uh, it's, there's a beautiful dance that needs to go on. So um, yeah, I think you're getting at something really crucial, which is, all right, what now, what next, what do we do about this? And, and, and uh, how do we rise to whatever this means? Um, I think that's what kind of you're, you're getting at. Yeah, I'm getting um, at that definitely, but I'm also getting at this beautiful formulation can, with a couple of moves, be the ground for just profound despair. Oh, uh, interesting. Right, right. So, yeah, I'd like to hear about that. Well, like yeah. I just said, I mean, you can you can do all this, and you can get you can get well you, you you can get basically sort of the existentialist response to Hegel, which is yes, you have this grand machinery, right? And mm. but uh, we we really don't understand it. It is always overwhelmed. Uh, by the ambiguities of human life, the uncertain, the uh, irremovable uncertainties, uh, you know, this is the Kierkegaardian classic Kierkegaardian mm -hmm. response. And then, and then, given what I just said, and you know, what this like, are we? Is there reason to believe we're capable of this? And then you throw into it, you know, the human proclivity for self-deception, the inherent combinatorial explosive nature of reality um uh the fact that with radical emergence there's radical uncertainty and i think this is a really important idea for any conception mm -hmm. of reason or uh, i think mm -hmm. we've come to the end of the project of understanding uncertainty as probable risk right that of course is a thing but it does not grasp the kind of uncertainty that is introduced with radical emergence and emanation, I would say, but you know what I mean? Mm, if yeah. the reality is like this, if it's a self-complexifying reality, there, is, you know, this is a white Hedian point. There's a novelty that is there that, that introduces like, you know, a radical uncertainty within, you know, the combinatorially explosive, ambiguous, uh, tempting to self-deception thing. And then that's what I say, you get this sort of apparatic sense and that, that what I just did, I think can cause despair, right? right. Uh, yeah, I, I tried to evoke it as best I could there. Yeah, no, I think that that's, I'll speak to that from my own perspective. Um, so for me, yeah, I think I agree with everything there. I will say that I, for me, I, if you think about the knowledge as a, you know, as an island and as you expand, you actually expand the uncertainty and inevitably, um, I'm, I am I feel like I'm situated in an agnostic space, ultimately. I don't have foundational truth in relation, and therefore I am inevitably situated at a backdrop of aporia that I'll, I'll always have to deal with. Um, that's what I, that is what I expect. I will say that within my own experience of the evolution of this frame, the cumulative knowledge that it grounds me in does situate, it homes me in a particular sort of way that, uh, mm. that, that it is... Um, sort of the opposite of aporia, uh, at least within the, the ground of what I would say my soul spirit feels. So I feel networked into a, a bubble of ambiguity that actually has a bubble of clarity within it that holds my soul. Uh, so it, speaking for myself, what I find as in the aporia and, and is is what I'm okay, but I don't know what to do that often, mm. I guess. <laughs> Like where, how do you interface? You talked about I'm an entity and membraning over course of time. And then you get the enormous uncertainty of the current institutional structure, inertia, embodied knowledge systems, what people actually need across a wide variety due to cut. And I get overwhelmed myself with the engineering problem or, or the, the, the uh, and I like some of the things that Jonathan Rousen said in his sort of perspective is like, okay, what can we ask of ourselves in terms of action? Well, there's an attitudinal shift. There's a perspective dynamic. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about what we should do. I don't know, John, how that lands in terms of what, but that, when I hear aporia, that, that's certainly where I find myself repeatedly that's, that, landing. Yeah, there's uh, definitely, anyway. it's definitely that. Um, but I'm also, uh, yes. So resonating deeply with that. Uh, but I, but I also, I, I'm also resonating with what Brendan said, but I want to draw him out mm -hmm. a bit, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and, okay. uh, so mm -hmm. you, I mean, you, you have faith and I take it, you don't mean assertion without evidence. I, I take it. You don't mean the pretense of certainty. I don't take it. You mean the attempt to silence opposition or all the other meanings of faith <laughs> that we've had. You've had this ultimate concern. And then you have this sense of being called by something beyond you. Uh, you know, Ricoeur talks about, you know, uh, that weird way we're tempted by evil and we're tempted by the good. Mm -hmm. And so, and you alluded to the good. And then there's something like the momentum gives you a sense that you're being called by the good, which is beyond any final formulation, but it keeps the promise 
that the through line of complexifying right disclosure enhanced intelligibility will never be broken mm. that's a kind of faith i have mm. in, in that i have that sense of being called like magnetically drawn towards the good and that that promise mm. that promise moment by moment century by century eon by eon is maintained and this big history gives me right the trust that's at the core of the promise um mm. so that would be my response. I'm, yeah. I'm interested in what I want to hear, if possible, what both of you think about that as a it's sort of a post Hegelian, right, mm -hmm. Neoplatonic kind of mm. faith. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's really that was very beautifully said. When I mean faith, uh, that's been such a distorted word. But even if you go back to the original Greek, like pistis, it meant something like trust. Yes. So when I when I think faith, I think there's a trust in 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 the way things will unfold. And that's not ungrounded. It's grounded on 13.8 billion years of cosmic history uh, yes. moving in a particular direction. Um, so, uh, and I think, you know, you can look back and get the precedence and see the pattern unfolding, which is the grounds for that. But then you can look forward and whether that's to in Greg's mythopoeic expression, an elephant sun god or a kaleidoscopic eye or whatever symbolization we want to render for this sort of, or Bobby Azarian's Omega and, you know, Deschardins and all that. There's something that we are moving to, and that is the promise of 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 the history. The there's a, a kind of reimagining of sacred history, you could say, going on in a project like this, um, where, uh, it, but not in a naive way, and in, in appreciating yeah, yeah, all of yeah, the yeah, um, yeah. the endless sort of right. It's not. It's also not just that everything becomes more and more better. <laughs> it's, it's no, also no, like no, no. It, things are are becoming always because they're more complex sort of more fragile and also more there's more agency so there's so much more possibility for like really profound suffering right uh and so as things go on this complexification arc they are moving in the direction of the potential for greater goodness and agency and beauty and all these wonderful things but that's potential and then that is where we show up in those continual chirotic moments and we activate the potential and we need something like that through line that uh, that that calling figure or image or symbol that orients us in that direction because when you get enough parts oriented in that direction towards that attractor you're going to get um you're going to get movement in that direction and so um yeah i think in many ways these are perennial issues uh, there's nothing necessarily mm -hmm. unique about talking about the religious aspirational project and all that it entails and the struggles of living in a world in which there's a lot of incoherence and chaos and and, and disconnection and whatnot but um but there's also like yeah there's something that we aspire to that's that's in that that um that i think is sort of the guide and and that also complexifies too, so that that's a, that's part of the process. I think the last thing maybe I'll say about that too is that when you identify the pattern, right? There's something, there's a deep, uh, there's a deep logic to it in some ways that is 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 also maybe reassuring in some in some way uh, that uh, we can also celebrate and when we see that unfolding and when we see that manifested in the world. Um, and I think, yeah, again, just to bring back the perennial aspect, this is what the religious life has sort of always been about is like, you do your work, you, 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 you add your part to the cathedral and you, you hope that it continues. Right. Um, and there may be times when there are earthquakes or when people give up the project or whatever, but all we can do as sort of agents, uh, in this arena is, uh, is, is is our work i don't know yeah, if that's no, a, if a satisfying answer but well, yeah no I, it is but i, I wanted to hear what, what greg had to say too yeah no I, obviously the you know the nature of my work took me into this sort of big history complexification formulation and i now situate myself in that story i i, I have faith in that story i see myself as carrying a little a uh, baton of energy information across the stack um, that is trying to build frequencies and nodes and networks. And, and it is the case that I see the unfolding of that in a way that both gives me sort of a poor, you mentioned the attractor, I'll, you know, the third attractor. I like that formulation, Daniel Schmachtenberger, um, uh, you know, uh, um, Alexander Bard, others have certainly given this idea that as the chaos of our current situation emerges, um, and the uncertainty emerges, we have a lot of danger for the response to either be a breakdown 
or then totalitarian control, where you're, as you go through flux, the dialectic of chaos and order becomes intense, and we're definitely dangerous. I think we're in a dangerous point in our lives uh, to find ourselves either into a, a chaotic breakdown, a global civilization collapse kind of dynamic, or retaliation against that that is going to centralize control in a very dangerous way with the digital you know, AI scenario being something that now could get control of a network of a new medium of information processing that creates a control variable that that enslaves us all. Mm-hmm. I think both of those are very plausible and dangerous realities. And a protopian reality is also p- possible, meaning an awareness of what a much better awareness of our human natures and much better awareness of our need for relationship, a much better understanding of what I call the wisdom stack from energy to matter, life, mind, and culture, and its relationship, our relationship with each other and the planet, and then the digital that would afford collective well-being in a, t- in a different way. So for me, the issue is the orientation or the good is how can I be a good ancestor? What would be the ripple effects of my activity across the arc of time as long as I could imagine it? And I can only imagine it to the back half of the 21st century, maybe a little further. And then my little cognitive light gun, the elephant sun god can see further, but my little light gun is going gonna, is gonna to fade out and do that. And that that feels orienting and, and part of the story and my uh, small role in that story that that gives what my soul spirit orients to. Yeah, and I, I wanna just uh, add one a th- further aspect to that, which is that um, I think it's important to appreciate the, the needs of the moment, especially because that really is um, the the locus of of meaning making, right? And, and I mean, mm-hmm. your work especially tends to focus on that. While I do think that there's a a need for the ultimate environment and the, the the biggest map possible, it is when you start exploring into those reaches that the despair and the uncertainty and maybe even the nihilism starts to come uh, hard and fast. So if you want to just frame it in this sense, right, of like, uh, what does this get us if you want to put it in those terms, right? Like, uh, well, I think it gets us a shift from a worldview that, as you set up again at the beginning, of from a materialist, reductionistic, meaningless, nihilistic, destructive, um, you know, uh, mentality that is leading us further from viability and, and heading, causing us to head towards a cliff. Um, we need to meet the needs of that moment in our environment uh, wisely and successfully. And so maybe the broad scale scope of the entire story is a bit, uh, you know, daunting either in the sublime or a, or a terrifying way. But at the very least, I feel very called and driven and passionate about trying to respond to the needs of the moment. And that at the time of a meaning crisis is like the most meaningful thing that I think people can feel called to do. So, I mean, literally where this project leads as we were just talking to is becoming participatory uh, artists of the new divine, right? Yes, and yeah. if that's not a meaningful hmm. project, I don't know what is. So hmm. um, yeah, just another frame for that. That's lovely. That's an excellent place to draw things to a close because we are, hmm. uh, we come to the end of our allotted time, but um, uh, I just wanted to take this moment to thank you, uh, Brendan. That was uh, amazing work. And I really look forward to your book. Uh, and if you want somebody to read it and write a blurb for it, I'm happy to do so. I don't know. Um, uh, uh, really excellent. Um, Thank you. But I'd like to give you and Greg um, the final word. Perhaps we'll start with Greg and then we'll end with you, uh, Brendan. Yeah, no, I'll just echo John's uh, thought. I thought that the setup uh, that we got from the sort of network of the entities in the field and then the coalescing of that and dissipative structures and the emergence of information and then symbolic and then ultimately we're really a symbolic semantic stack. And this is what meaning is and it's meaning is what's relevant for the entity. Um, it, was, it was very, of course, congruent. and um, But the issue, the orientation then towards our collective structures and the meaning making that that affords us in in a different fundamental grammar than we've been given at least from the modern natural physical science worldview is i think very exciting and inspiring and then to to bring the angle that you have brought to it is really i look forward to uh, expanding on this next time uh when we sort of may, you know we can i being invite you to share some a little bit perhaps yeah. about what we would do uh, yeah. next time and bridge that but you know thank you absolutely brendan you know how much i admire your work and it's been lovely uh to hear uh your articulation of it here 
Thank you. Uh, thank you both so much. This is fantastic. I mean, uh, yeah, in some ways it's a bit of a fire hose, but this context to be able to get into this stuff is so rewarding for me. And I really do think very important. Um, there's something, and you know, John, when you're laying out some of your philosophical arguments, you talked about the importance of convergence. Yeah. Um, and I just yeah. see so much convergence yes, happening in very fascinating ways, not just amongst us, but amongst, you know, many of the people we named and many we didn't, that there's something happening, right? There's something yep. going on there. And there's a lot of sense in which there is some some kind of attractor that's uh, that, is, that we're oriented towards. And um, so I appreciate that. And that is a deeply meaningful thing to be a small part of that uh, conversation, which, you know, in its most aspirational way is, is really trying to forge a new worldview and a new potential way of being in the world that is oriented towards wisdom, integrity, uh, et cetera. So um, yeah, I, I look forward to continuing the conversation next time and uh, and maybe developing the thoughts or challenging them or going in whatever direction uh, seems to emerge. But thank you all very much. It's great. Yeah. yeah so one of the things that I'll uh, just, I think, encourage us to, is like, okay, there's an emerging architecture. What are we seeing, doing, hopeful for, challenging with in terms of like, if this is where we are now and it's the situation we find ourselves in, uh, what affordances should we be seeking? How should we orient our attitude? What is the way in which we can uh, you know, challenge this to make it more refined and effective, incorporated amongst within a group? And then, you know, is there are the things that we should be doing or trying to do uh, as it unfolds? Yeah, I want to do all of that. Um, and first of all, uh, just to say it wasn't a water hose, you were laying out a framework. We can, in the second okay. episode, we can together, we can go into this. Right. And what I would like, uh, my request is everything that Greg said. <laughs> and then I want more explication, elucidation on this reciprocal reconstruction of religion and God that we've been mm. banging up against. Mm. And how does that you have like interact with everything Greg was talking about, about what we do and what the practice like uh, that's what I would like to try and um, probe and uh, uh, draw out from you if possible. That sounds great. Love yeah. It. Okay. Thank you so much, right. gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.